looked at something a little bit different. I know quite often when I come out, the afternoon meeting is on prophecy. Um, but this meeting is not quite on prophecy, though it does have to do with current events, and it kind of dovetails into what we talked about this morning. Because in 1992, 25 years ago, when the book Issues came out, it was an assault on sanctification. And as we noticed this morning, all of the teachings that we hold as a people are like dominoes. And if you hit one, every other one starts to spin out and it falls too. So sanctification was considered by the General Conference a moot theological issue. And moot again meaning irrelevant or not important. And because the Sabbath is a sign of sanctification, because the sanctuary and the Day of Atonement zero in on sanctification, and the spirit of prophecy and the three angels' messages have at their core sanctification. When the General Conference in 1992 came out with the book Issues and said sanctification is irrelevant and it's not essential to our salvation, folk, they didn't just knock that out. They knocked out the Sabbath, they knocked out the sanctuary, they knocked out the spirit of prophecy, and they knocked out the three angels' messages. Well, at that very time in Seventh-day Adventism, and it had been coming in for a few years, but it was right around in that time when all kinds of false doctrines just started flying every which way. And the Apostle Paul struggled with that too. And that's what we're going to look at this afternoon. It's called Trouble in Galatia, a perverted gospel. Paul, of course, in Galatians chapter 1, declared in verse 3, he said, Grace be unto you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and the Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So this was Paul's gospel right here, that Christ died for our sins, that he might deliver us from the sinfulness of this world, from the sinfulness of our nature, and to give us power to overcome. That was Paul's gospel. But in Galatians 1 and verse 6, we read about another element that was coming in to Seventh-day Adventism because Paul was a Seventh-day Adventist. He preached the righteousness of Christ. He preached obedience to the law of God. He preached the sanctuary through the book of Hebrews. He preached that Christ came in our carnal flesh. Paul preached the three angels' messages, folks in his context. Well, there were Seventh-day Adventists who followed Paul wherever he went, and after Paul would come in and preach the truth, others would come in after him, and they would preach something else. Now let's notice it in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, as Paul picks it up here. He says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, folk, I would ask you this afternoon, can unity be found in that? Can unity ever be found where there's truth 
and there is obvious error, can there be unity? That's impossible. And so Paul said, I'm going to give you the pure gospel, and folk that are giving a perverted message, they're cursed. There was no harmony, there was no unity, there was no talk of unity, because it would never happen. And folk, the same thing exists today. There will never be unity among Seventh-day Adventists. Amongst those that maintain their faith in the three angels' messages in overcoming the sanctuary, 1844, the law of God, the Sabbath, the apostate Protestant churches, Babylon fallen, the papacy is the Antichrist. Those who hold to those messages will forever be unified. But folk, if a Seventh-day Adventist comes along and says, well, I'm going to be saved in my sins, immediately, is there going to be unity? There can't be unity. If somebody comes along and says, Jesus took Adam's nature before the fall, can there be unity with that and Christ took the nature of Adam after his fall? That can't happen, folks. And it won't happen. So Paul lays it out and he says, I preach the truth, but there were perverts that came along and gave a false gospel. Now, folk, hang with me for a little while, but it's going to become very, very clear today that what went on in Paul's day is happening now. And that we have, and excuse my English, but I don't know how else to say it. I'm just using Paul's words. We have people who are giving a perverted gospel message as well. Right in our midst today, folk. And we've got to be aware of it. And we've got to deal with them just as Paul did. We don't fellowship with them like they're our brothers. They're not. We just say, look it, we don't see eye to eye on that. Now let's table it. Paul preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So there was Paul's gospel. After Paul preached, others came in preaching another gospel. They said salvation came through some other means other than faith in Christ, which led to obedience to all of God's commandments. They made salvation dependent on some issue. Now in Galatians there were two issues. And we read about them right here in Galatians 2, 6 to 9, and Galatians 4, 9 and 10. These were the two cardinal issues that the perverts in Galatia were promoting as their gospel. Right here, folk. Galatians 2, 6 to 9, Paul says, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Peter, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Now, folk, there were people that were coming into the churches of Galatia and they were making circumcision an issue of salvation. And Paul said, away with that nonsense. Away with that perversion, Christ wanted to cut away the foreskin of the carnal flesh, of the carnal mind, to empower people to overcome. That was Paul's gospel. He said, away with this idea that all the Gentile converts have to be circumcised. In fact, the Jewish converts, the Adventists, 
in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, they said, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So they made circumcision salvational. It became a salvational issue. Have you heard anybody lately come to you and say, you know, brothers and sisters, if if you don't believe this particular idea, you're going to be lost. Have you heard anybody say that to you? You have, Eugene. Okay, some of you haven't. We'll go into more specifics in a little while, and it might become clearer, and you might recognize it a little bit differently. The other issue that came in in Galatians is in Galatians 4, 9, and 10. The Bible says, but now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. Now, what was Paul talking about? He was talking about the Jewish feast days. It was only the Jewish feast days that contained ceremonial Sabbath days that could land on any day of the week, new moons or months, because all of the Jewish feast days were built on the new moon. The times, which were another, the actual meaning for times was set occasions or feasts and jubilee years. All of those four things had to do with the Jewish feast days. This didn't have any, I had one man say, oh, that's talking about Christmas and Easter. Folk, that was not an issue in Paul's day. Now, our evangelical friends will tell us, well, you Adventists, you observe days. That, that, that has to do with the seventh-day Sabbath. No, it doesn't. Because the seventh-day Sabbath was never built on the new moon. Never was, friend. Seventh-day Sabbath was always built on a weekly cycle. The seven-day weekly cycle. So there were people in Galatia that said, oh, you've got to be circumcised to be saved. You've got to keep the feast days to be saved. And Paul called folk that were embracing these issues perverts. People who were perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes things haven't changed very much, have they? Have you ever heard somebody today come to you and say, Brother, do you want to be saved? And you say just what that little guy just said. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so what do they do? They say, well, you've got to keep the feast days. Have you heard that? I have. Just last week on Thursday night. Betty, Okay, at market night. Folk, this has come full circle for the last 2,000 years. The same thing that happened in Paul's day is happening now. People have gotten up these issues and said, If you want to be saved, you've got to believe this. This is an issue of salvation. Just like they did 20 centuries ago. You want to be saved, you've got to be circumcised and keep the feast days. These are salvational issues. This was what the perverted ones were saying in Galatia. Do we have this same thing among us today? Right here in America, in Adventism? 
want to be saved, you have to what? You know, folk, see, you and I understand, I think we do, about the three unclean spirits in Revelation chapter 16 that come out of the mouth of the beast the dragon, and the false prophet. And one of those three unclean spirits, the beast is the papacy. The dragon, well, the false prophet is apostate Protestantism. The dragon's cardinal teaching that is going to suck in the whole world is spiritualism. Communion with the dead. You know, Paul went so far as to say, if somebody gets involved in some side issue like the feast days or circumcision or something else, that they have come under the control of an evil spirit. Now, I want to read to you what Paul says. It's right here, Galatians 3, verses 1 to 3. Paul said, Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Bewitched? What's another word for being bewitched? Deceived. Hypnotized. NLP. It's a form of NLP. It's a form of mind control. that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? See, I look at the word bewitch, to be bewitched, is to come under the control of somebody who is possessed by an evil spirit. As Saul came under the control of the witch of Endor. The Galatians were charmed into believing a lie, bewitching sorcery, spiritualism. Because these ones in Galatia had rejected Christ. This is getting scary, friends. You know, we read it in the book Issues this morning, and now we turn it around and we go to the other side of the coin. When people embrace issues, they reject Christ. They reject His power in their lives, and they're wide open to false doctrine. They're holding communion with somebody who should be dead. That's what spiritualism is all about. Well, the one that they've started off holding communion with who should be dead is the old man of sin. You see, folk, when when you and I refuse to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, we're wide open for anything. Evil spirits, doctrines of devils. We can be hoodwinked into believing anything. Just as the people in Galatia were. When we embrace an idea and say salvation depends on one accepting it, like circumcision or the feast days, we're under the control of an evil spirit as well because we too have rejected Christ. And it's happening today in Seventh-day Adventism. It's happening today. It's fascinating to me in Great Controversy 560 as Ellen White talks about Satan's masterpiece of spiritualism. She uses these words. She says, All whose faith is not firmly established upon the Word of God will be deceived and overcome. And the context, friend, is the appearance of the spirits of devils. So 
We can, we can know that the dead don't know anything. But if we're holding communion with our carnal nature that's supposed to have died, friends, we're, we're communing with something that should be dead. So we're wide open to listen to doctrines of devils. Satan works with all deceivableness of unrighteousness to gain control of the children of men. His deceptions will continually increase, but he can gain his object only as men voluntarily yield to his temptations. Those who are earnestly seeking a knowledge of the truth and are striving to purify their souls through obedience, thus doing what they can to prepare for the conflict, will find in the God of truth a sure defense. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee. Revelation 3.10 is the Savior's promise. He would sooner send every angel out of heaven to protect his people than leave one soul that trusts in him to be overcome by Satan. Praise the Lord, folks. Praise the Lord. As Proverbs 18 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59, 19. Great Controversy 557, 558. It's true that spiritualism is now changing its form and veiling some of its more objectionable features, is assuming a Christian guise. While it formally denounced Christ in the Bible, it now professes to accept both. Now notice what spiritualism dwells on. Love is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God, but it is degraded to a weak sentimentalism, making little distinction between good and evil. God's justice, his denunciations of sin, the requirements of his holy law are all kept out of sight. You know, I am sorry, but whenever I read that quote, it reminds me of an experience years ago. In 1992, when that book Issues came out, and I'm sure some of you have heard me say this story, But I was called into the Northern California Conference Office in Pleasant Hill, California. And the superintendent of education, a nice man, a nice man. They're always nice. <laughs> they are, they're always nice. In fact, I saw him the very man that fired me. I saw him about two or three years ago at the old spaghetti factory right here in Redlands. And I saw him and I, I said, Elder Hutchins, it's good to see you. I don't have anything against him. In fact, the one thing I wish I'd done is I wish I had thanked him for firing me 25 years ago. <laughs> Oh, he looked at me in that room that day with the other, his other two educational men, and he said, Bill, he said, I've got a job lined up for you for the next school year. Two-teacher school, you'll be the head teacher, you'll have a parsonage right there on the campus, right in uh, Lakeport, California, beautiful area. He said, under one condition. I said, okay, what, what's the condition? He said, you've got to promise me in this room right now that you will not preach the three angels' messages in public. 
I looked at Elder Hutchins and I said, I said, Elder Hutchins, what do you want me to preach? And you know what he said? He said, the love of God. The love of God. I said, Elder Hutchins, that is the love of God. He said, I'm not here to quibble with you, Bill. I need an answer. <coughs> you know, the next day, I was in, two days after that, I was in church Sabbath morning. And somebody turns around and hands me a great controversy. And it was open to great controversy 557, 558. And the person said, read this right here. Now, they had no idea what had happened to me two days before that. No idea. And I read it, and it says, the new spiritualism today dwells only upon the love of God. And it keeps God's justice, his denunciations of sin, the requirements of his holy law are all kept out of sight. And I step back and I, that's what I heard in that conference office. I heard spiritualism. I heard don't talk about the Ten Commandments. Don't talk about the sanctuary. Don't talk about apostate Protestants. Don't talk about Roman Catholicism. Don't talk about victory over sin. Talk about love. That's spiritualism. And if we're listening Sabbath in and Sabbath out to somebody just talking about love, oh, let's just, let's just get warm fuzzies and love each other. That's modern day spiritualism. That's bewitchery. That's right. I'll have to look that word up later. People of Galatia and Jerusalem had embraced an idea to save them. They had rejected Christ. They were under the charms of Satan and were under the old covenant. How many of us today are in the same position without Christ and is lost as the heathen? Acts of the Apostles, 386 and 387. It says the apostle urged the Galatians to leave the false guides by whom they had been misled and to return to the faith that had been accompanied by unmistakable evidences of divine approval. The men who had attempted to lead them from their belief in the gospel were hypocrites, unholy in heart, corrupt in life. Folk, we need to make the application here. When we have folk that are advocating ideas that they claim are salvational. They're false guides. They're hypocrites. They're unholy in heart and corrupt in life. They're perverts. Their religion was made up of a round of ceremonies through the performance of which they expected to gain the favor of God. They had no desire for a gospel that called for obedience to the word. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3, 3. They felt that a religion based on such a doctrine required too great a sacrifice. They clung to their errors, deceiving themselves and others. To substitute external forms of religion for holiness of heart and life is still as pleasing to the unrenewed nature as it was in the days of these Jewish teachers. Today as then, there are false spiritual guides to whose doctrines many listen eagerly. It is Satan's studied effort to divert minds from the hope of salvation through faith in Christ and obedience to the law of God. In every age, the arch enemy adapts his temptations to the prejudices or inclinations of those whom he is seeking to deceive. So, folk, if we hear people today advocating feast days, that's a deception. They're a false guide. That's hypocrites, hypocrisy, unholy in heart, corrupt in life. These are, this is scary stuff, folk, because I've run into scores of people that are involved in false doctrines, scores of people. 
I remember on one prayer line I was on out of Southern California at the Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church with Gwen Shorter. She had asked me on the program, she said, Bill, will you go into some of these false doctrines? You know, and just lay them out there for people, but we got to let people know these are wrong. And I said, well, Gwen, what are you talking about? And she said, well, you know, like, like uh, folk that want to... Um, just obsess on Yahweh. Or folk that want to just just zero in on the feast days. Or they want to zero in on the Holy Spirit not being a person, but a presence. And the 2520, I said, Gwen, I'd be happy to. Well, you know, folk, we started in on the, the first one I think we did was on the feast days. And I don't know how Gwen did it with her, you know, with opening the phone lines and all that. But as soon as I said amen at the end of my talk on the feast days, this lady somehow got on the line and boy, she just took me up this side and down the other. Because I had gone after her pet idea that was going to save her. She was livid with me. And that's something else to keep note of. When somebody is in false teaching, the only way they can defend it is by attacking you personally. Friend, don't go there. Our, our job is to share the truth. But we do it with the graciousness of Jesus Christ. We don't do it to destroy somebody, but we do it to say, here's the truth, now where are you going to stand? That's what we do. Adventism of old was being overwhelmed by spiritualism as we are today and we're under the old covenant. When we turn from submission to Christ and embrace an issue as salvational, we have fallen under Satan's spell and are as verily lost as were the Jews. Now, the next few slides, we're going to get into a few issues here. And... Um, I'm not in the uh, I'm not in the business of apologizing, and I'm not going to start now. Um, I don't know how else to do it, folk, but just say, "Here's a spade, and that's a spade, and it will always be a spade." So we're going to look at some issues that are bewitching, that are controlling and mesmerizing and hypnotizing Seventh-day Adventists today. And it's the opposite extreme of what we read this morning in the book Issues. Here we go. We've all heard the sentimental love gospel that puts us in heaven without surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ. But what about the issues, the salvational issues that are proposed without which we are told we will be lost? Well, here's the first two that I came up with. The next slide will finish it. Salvation in the feast days. There's one. Salvation in the sacred name of God. Now, folk, there is beautiful truth in what the feast days represented. Because as Colossians 2 says, they were all a shadow pointing forward to something Christ would do. But to say today that we are to keep them, friends, that's, that's apostasy. I remember being in a northwestern, uh, midwestern state here last summer, I think it was, and there was an individual at the meetings that uh, 
we were going down through the three angels' messages, step by step by step, and this lady was going around to everybody at the meetings, and she was saying, you know, we need to be keeping the feast days. And so one of the folk at the meeting, one of the directors came up to me and said, so-and-so is telling everybody they need to keep the feast days. What should we do? And I said, well, at the next meeting, I will expose that. So I got up in the next meeting and started talking about the feast days being a shadow and all pointing forward to Christ. And this individual raised her hand and she said, Oh, but brother, this is salva a salvational issue. And I said, Ma'am, tell me something. If you could in this state today, would you kill a lamb to keep the Passover? She said, If I could, I absolutely would. I said, And ma'am, you just denied that Jesus Christ came into this world. You have rejected Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I said, ma'am, you are in apostasy. You need to repent or you will be lost. After that meeting, she left and didn't come back. Folks, she was ready to kill a lamb right there on the spot. Salvation in the sacred name of God. Now that's in Yahweh. Yahweh is a beautiful name for God, but it's not the only name. There are many beautiful names, and all of the names for God in Scripture reveal something about His character. Yahweh means the God who is, the God who is sovereign judge, the God who sees need, and goes about to meet that need. It's beautiful. But there's also Elohim, El Shaddai, Adonai, El Roy, and a host of other names as well. And they all reveal God's character. So to fixate on one name and make it salvational, friend, that's a perversion. It's a perversion. Number three, salvation, the rejection of the Godhead. Christ was a created being. The Holy Spirit is a presence. As I was sharing last night, well, I had a gentleman in Ohio years ago who had listened when I was at Prophecy Countdown back in the 90s. Well, that was a long time ago. Kind of makes you feel older, doesn't it, Pastor Cortez? <laughs> <laughs> this man called me and he said he said Bill God has raised you up to tell the people of Africa that Jesus was created and the Holy Spirit is a presence he is not a person I said you really believe that don't you he said oh absolutely and he said and I've got money and I'll help you to do it You know, it's interesting how, you know, some people that have money, they, they want to use it for the proclamation of the three angels' messages. And other people have money, and they want to use it to force you. They use it kind of like the, the little prod. You know, if I give you this money, are you going to present this? And that's what he was doing. And I said, you know what? I said, when, when the Lord impresses me that that's what I'm supposed to tell the people of Africa, then I'll let you know. But until that time, you keep your money. Folk, the Bible, the spirit of prophecy are very clear that the Holy Spirit is a person. And the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are very clear that Jesus Christ is the one who has been with his Father from all eternity. Isaiah 9, verse 6, and I don't know how, you, how somebody can twist this, 
But it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, folk, I don't understand that, but I simply accept what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy say. I had some folk just a few weeks ago from Australia that called and talked to me for a good half hour and were trying to convince me of this very subject, number three up there on the board. And finally, we came back a half hour later and I started repeating myself and I said, wait a minute, this is on your dime. I'm just going to keep repeating what I have already said. So I think it's time we close this conversation. Have a wonderful day. And it was done. But folk, <laughs> salvational issue people make it out to be. And if you don't accept their view and you don't accept and preach it as salvational, you're lost. You're lost. Number four, salvation in the Wednesday crucifixion. That one's kind of, don't hear it very often, but I've heard it some. Number five, salvation in the doctrine that God doesn't kill. Now, folk, obviously God doesn't break his commandments. But God does execute justice. Just as a judge in a courtroom scene, when he executes justice on a criminal that has used his power of choice to kill or maim somebody else, and the judge sentenced that person to die, the judge is not guilty of murder. He's simply executing justice. And that's what the God of heaven does. He does not break his commandment but he most surely executes justice. As he did with the antediluvians, with Sodom and Gomorrah, with Uzzah, with the 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in the time of Zennacherib. God executed justice. Point number six, salvation in extremes in diet or dress reform. You know, we've had delightful people come through our little church in Florida. One day at Sabbath lunch, um, an individual that was a health reformer sat down with me and she looked at me and she said, Brother, you've got to preach the full message here. I said, Okay. Okay, that's a fair statement. Tell me what the full message is. And she said... Uh, You've got to tell everybody in your congregation they've got to eat just two meals a day. <laughs> and I said, so that's the whole message? She said, absolutely. I said, now, ma'am, what do I do with, with construction workers in my church that get up at 5 in the morning that work 12 to 14 hours a day in the hot, humid Florida weather what do I tell them about two meals a day? I said they eat at 5.30 in the morning, they eat again around 11, and so I'm supposed to tell them when they are tired and hungry at 5 or 4 in the afternoon that they can't eat something? Look, the health message is beautiful. I eat two meals a day. But that's not salvational. If somebody wants to have a light, meat, a, a light meal in the evening, that's up to them. But that certainly is not our message. Our message of health is about, you know, of course it's about diet. Of course it's about eating right, spreading our meals apart, not eating between meals. Those are all important. That's not all the health message is. It's about exercise. It's about drinking enough water. You know, I this thing about water with me, you know, I was listening to somebody talk about health many years ago, and they said, you know, 
in order to properly hydrate your body, they said you take your body weight and divide it by two, and that's the number of ounces of water you, your body needs every single day. So I weigh about 190. I cut that in half. To stay healthy and strong, I need 95 ounces of water. But you know what? The problem comes in with that when you got to get up and speak and you drink 40 or 50 ounces of water in the morning. I think you understand what I'm talking about. But folk, that's important. That's important that we get enough water. It's very important. Otherwise, we start getting headaches and we feel groggy. I know I do. But when I get in and drink my water, I feel good. I feel hydrated. I feel strong. So we've got diet. We have drinking enough water, half of our body weight, exercise. You know, we've got to get our heart beating 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day. That's important just for good physical health and to have a good mind, a strong mind. Blood circulating, absolutely. Um, plenty of sleep. Now, that's not very easy for me when I come out west, I'll be honest with you. But on a habitual basis, we got to get to bed at a good hour of night. we got to sleep well. Ellen White told college-age young people, be in bed by half past nine. It's 9.30 at night. Why? She says, she told them, she said, you are making huge decisions for your future. You need to have a clear mind to make good choices. Well, folk, how much more do we need to make clear choices? So we've got to get to bed at a good hour of the night, not burning the midnight oil. I used to think when I first started studying the Bible, you know, you hear miracle stories. That's what people call them, miracle stories. When you, you go to bed at 2 or 3 or 4 in the morning and you pray and you say, Lord, wake me up at a certain time, you know, so I can have a good devotional time with you. And so then they, they wake up at that exact time that they prayed, like say 6 in the morning. So they got three, four, three or 4 hours of sleep and they say, the Lord performed a miracle. No, he didn't. You're being intemperate. You can't do that and be healthy. And how many times when we get to bed and burn the midnight oil and we get up in the morning and we kneel down to pray, what happens to us? We fall asleep. <laughs> Bingo! That didn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out, did it? Folk, you know, and, and then after that, we get up and we start reading our Bible, and what happens? Our eyes start going cross-eyed, and, and we're going, man, the Bible's just kind of boring. I don't think I want to read it. Is the problem with the Bible? No. no, it's with us. We're being intemperate. If we want to have a vibrant devotional time, we got to get to bed. we got to be temperate in our sleeping habits. And you know, that connects right along with, with eating. If we eat a third meal, we don't want to eat right near bedtime. Because if we do, and if we eat a big meal at night, folk, we go to bed, we don't sleep well. Many times you dream all kinds of wild stuff. <laughs> Because your mind and your stomach are agitated. That's just physical law. I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I can understand that. So I've got to eat three or four hours before bedtime. It's important. Ellen White wasn't trying to beat us over the head with some health law just to beat us over the head. God showed her physiology. He showed her how the laws of health work. So it's important, but we don't want to be in extremes. 
Number seven, salvation in only the original writings of Ellen White. The man who originated that up in Oregon, Vernon Bates, came to me when I was up in Oregon back in 1996. After the meetings were over, he walked up and he said, Brother, he said, uh, the Lord's called you to give a special message. I said, what's that, Brother Bates? He said, there's only certain writings of Ellen White that we can use. I said, oh, really? Why is that? He said, well, all of the older books, they've been changed. And we can't depend upon them anymore. And so I said, well, well, Brother Bates, can you give me an example of that? Show me a book of Ellen White's where it's been changed. Well, he pulled out a book. I don't remember. It may have been early writings. But he read read a complete sentence that went over two lines. And he read it in one of his original writings books. And then he read it in the the early writings book that I read out of. And he said, now, brother, can't you see the difference? I said, Brother Bates, the only difference I see is that Ellen White put a period in the updated book, and in the older book, there was a semicolon. The meaning of the passage hadn't changed a bit. Folk, that's extremism. That's fanaticism. That's salvation in an issue. It's a perversion. It's a distraction from what we've been called to do. Salvation in the church is Babylon. Ellen White made it clear in testimonies to ministers, the church is not Babylon. Is it in apostasy today? Yes. Has it rejected the great truths that make us the people we are? Yes, but it's not Babylon yet. Okay, it's not. Salvation only outside the church. You've got some people that say salvation is in the church. You got to stay in the church to be saved. And then you've got Adventists that say salvation is only if you're outside of the church. You can't be connected or you're lost. What what does the book of Acts say? Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation's not in a building and it's not outside of a building. Salvation is found when I give my life in submission to the authority of Jesus Christ. That's where salvation is. Finally, salvation in the 2520. I think I've talked on that here. It's very clear from Scripture, from the chart of Ellen White in 1843, the Millerite chart and Ellen White's endorsement. In early writing, 74, I believe it is, Ellen White made it crystal clear that there were mistakes on the 1843 chart, even though God's hand had guided that chart. And from 1843 to 1863, when a final chart was made, there were a few charts made in between there, But from 1843 to 1863, the two changes that were made in the charts, one was 1843 became 1844. And the 2520 was obliterated from the 1863 chart. Why? Because there is no 2,520 years in Leviticus chapter 26. It's not talking about time. The Hebrew word there means the extent of punishment. It's an adverb. It has nothing to do with time prophecy. Jeff Pippinger and all the rest of the 2520 advocates, I'm sorry, friend, but based on the word of God, 
It's a perversion, and they're perverts. They're obliterating and butchering the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's that simple, friends. It's that simple. What will it be for us? Will it be Christ and Him crucified? Or will we get snagged by an issue? Tragically, folks, tragically, friends of mine, people in this very church that I have loved, that I have had in my own home in Florida, that we have done things together as friends, have been snagged by these false teachings. Friend, it's, a, it's just a very critical thing that we examine what we're doing with our lives on a daily basis in submission to Christ or going our own way. Going our own way will eventually get snagged by some issue. But Christ offers us an option. Galatians 5, verse 6, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Galatians 5, 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5, 24, They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Galatians 2, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Let's kneel together. Dear Father, we we often talk about a great controversy. And Father, we're seeing it happening all around us. We're thankful that Jesus came to this world not only to be an example, but to let us know that he will be with us today. And he will strengthen us to do what we can't. He will strengthen us as we choose him to resist our carnal flesh. Father, as we as we see friends, as we see loved ones, as we see people whom we fellowshiped with right in this very church that have been snagged by perversions, have been snagged by false doctrines. Father, I pray if there's any way that, that they can be brought back to the truth, please send the Holy Spirit to move on their hearts. We've all, we all, Lord, have friends and, and those in the church we know that have gotten snagged by these teachings. And we pray for the Holy Spirit again today to go to them, to awaken, to alert them to their danger before it is forever too late. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.